welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm so, so, so good, Brittany. And you know that. You already knew the answer to that question when you asked me. (laughs) No, I did. As I was saying before, we just got started. I was watching some of your videos this morning and was just like blown away by how much information you put out there about sex and having a healthy sex life. So I would love for you to kind of walk us through how you got to this point in your career and like, like how do people even become sex experts? Like how does this happen? Ha. Well, it's funny because I definitely did create the experience that I wanted in my life from a career and lifestyle perspective. My husband and I hit some rocky spots in our marriage about a decade in. And we said, well, the issue is intimacy. What can we do? And we decided to go to some sex workshops. And we thought, holy cow, if people knew about this stuff, they'd stop getting divorced. Because so many of our friends, were getting divorced when we were also thinking about it. And they all got divorced and we didn't. I really do believe that it was our sex life that saved our marriage. And we wanted to find a way to bring great information to people all over the world who either couldn't get to a Northern California sex workshop or wouldn't ever fricking go to one. (laughs) And over the years, I just learned more and more. I wanted I wanted to become a person who focused on passionate lovemaking techniques. I wanted wanted not to be a therapist or a psychologist or a sexologist. I wanted to just be a person who created, produced, published other people's work, my own work, that taught people how to have really, really hot, passionate, deeply connected sex. It could be, you know, role play and dirty talk and all that stuff, or it could be just soulmates and connecting spiritually. I wanted to have the spectrum of experience for people, but have it be from them feeling really confident that they knew what they were going for and what was possible. And I started out with sex techniques like how to have an expanded orgasm, how to do female ejaculation, how to become a multi-orgasmic man, so male and female orgasm techniques. And then what I realized is, oh, what's holding people back from these techniques is communication. I need to teach people how to talk to each other in the bedroom, how to ask for what they want, how to communicate their needs both in the moment and the long term. So then I started launching a whole bunch of bedroom communication skills. And also then I realized, oh, okay, sometimes people aren't having sex because they're pissed about some other aspect of their relationship. So how can I get people on the same page from a relationship perspective so that they're getting what they need out of the relationship so they're satisfied at the, in the general relationship so that they can have hot sex. So then I did my relationship magic type of work and relationship values and things. And then I realized, okay, there's another thing that's holding people back from having the hot sex that they want. And that is that for many people, they have sexual health issues, whether that's painful sex or erectile dysfunction or lichen sclerosis or endometriosis or polycystic ovary syndrome or low libido, general low libido, or they've had cancer or whatever, you know, there's like, I, they have they're afraid to get STIs or they got, they have herpes and they don't want to have sex because they don't want to give it to somebody or, you know, there's like a million <laughs> sexuality issues. And I thought, okay, I need to fix that. So <laughs> I created an event called the Sexual Vitality Summit, which answers all the sexual health issues, whether that's emotional or physical, because a lot of sexual health issues are trauma-based or judgment-based or shame-based or things like that. So that then I've been working on that for the last few years. So it's been a slow build over the last 15 years of really answering people's questions because I'm kind of like a dear Abby of sex, people from all over the world of every age every religious persuasion, every country, they email me their deepest, most personal, private questions. Mm -hmm. And I help them figure out what 
they can do. And by giving all this advice over all these years, it's given me a real flavor for that, you know, deep private sexual part of people where they are and what they desire and how to take them from where they are to where they want to go. But even more than where they want to go, showing them the map of what's possible. So look at this territory. You thought it was little little sex land you lived in, but look, there's sex universe. And <laughs> yeah. what do you want from that? Yeah. So it's been a journey for me of just ever expanding compassion and, and, and wisdom, giving people good practical tips. I like practical tips. Yeah. Like things you can actually implement like right now <laughs> or on the daily. <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing that you have so many people write in and like you're able to really see, I think like the trends then of what are happening globally sexually, which is really, really unique. So on that note, what are some trends that you do see and what are some like reoccurring problems that you see? And especially like, I don't know like how much information people actually give you, but are you seeing a difference in trends and problems for younger generations that are coming into adulthood now compared to people who are like 50s, 60s currently? Yeah. Okay. That's a good question, Britt. One of the trends that I'm seeing is in what I would call sexual biohacking. So people wanting to understand that their gut biome and that needs to be really solid for them, lower stress, better sleep to produce hormones naturally, and that they need to detox from our 21st century lifestyle. Mm -hmm vaginal restoration, like sex is painful. I got a scar. I have an episiotomy. I have a fistula. I have, I got damaged riding my horse. My vaginal tissue is thinning, you know, sex hurts, hormone replacement. And then all those new technologies like the orgasm shot using PRP, CO2 lasers and RF devices, both intravaginally up inside the vagina to take care of things as well, you know, to thicken the tissue, recover collagenate, et cetera. And even understanding that we have a vaginal microbiome in addition to a gastric microbiome. So awareness around that and hormone replacement. For men, understanding that the blood supply to their penis is when, it, when they start to lose erectile function, that they can go get gains wave treatments that knock the plaque out of the arteries and regenerate and stimulate new uh, nerve and blood supply mm -hmm. tissue growth. Men being much more open to using penis pumps or vacuum erection devices for not just penis enlargement, they're starting to understand that those pumps actually do increase girth and length of the penis. But also for a lot of men, they've had atrophy from illness or they've been in a 10-year marriage with no sex or, mm -hmm. you know, natural aging. So that whole area of what I would call genital restoration, using your body's own healing factors, there's a big groundswell there. Another big groundswell is, and I've got YouTube videos on all that galore. <laughs> another groundswell is in gender identity. A lot more people are, you know, I, when I've been a sex expert for the last 15 years, it's been masculine, feminine, but now younger people are having much more varied gender expression and there becomes some sexual confusion around polarity, the masculine, feminine, yeah. magnetic piece that can go missing with same-sex couples. So I've been doing a lot more around how to create polarity in your sex life, no matter what your gender expression mm. is or how fluid it is. It's amazing how backward other countries are compared to the US and Australia mm. and Germany and the Netherlands. I'd say those four countries and Canadians are really up on things too. And New Zealand, although it's a tiny little country, those countries are very sexually forward. Australia and New Zealand are way more sexually open than we are. G Germany's very sexually open and willing to talk mm -hmm. about things. Americans are still very puritanical, but we're doing all kinds of weird shit. <laughs> pretty much 
porn use. Mm. So there's a lot of like, I'm addicted to porn. My boyfriend treats me like a porn star. You know, there's a lot of backlash to the kids who've grown up at 10 years old, their first sexual impressions are more and more hardcore porn. So like there's that issue that's been interesting. Other countries, they don't even give their kids any advice about sex. They're totally in the dark. They, they're afraid that masturbation is going to make them sterile or, you know, there's just like a million crazy ideas that people who live in a vacuum of no information make up and scare themselves with. So I just talked a woman through having sex with her husband the first three times over Instagram from she'd been married to him for five years and she was afraid to have sex with him. She was afraid for him to see her naked body. She was afraid of the whole thing. You know, so it's just, it's just very, very interesting to see just the wide variety of sexual expression and things. And then another trend is that 50 and 60 year olds are like, well, I want to have sex till the day I die. What do I need to do? Like my, my parents' sex life might have been over at 50, but mine's friggin' not going to be. Yeah. So that whole kind of like biohacking, anti-aging, longevity, health conscious, you know, that world has their own desires to just be highly functioning sexually for the rest of their life. And then a lot more young women are really leading the, the cause of consciously communicated and connected sex. So young people in their 20s are much more, much less transactional than the people who came before them, much more willing to slow down and have boundaries and negotiate agreements. So Mm -hmm. people are coming more into their comfort around talking about sex than they ever were before. There's less and less unconscious sex, though there's tons of it. The rise of superbugs and STIs, that's a big one. I mean, there are over 20 sexually transmitted infections, and most of them are actually skin-to-skin contact, not, you know, just like blood-borne or semen and vaginal mucosal-borne infections. And with the rise of antibiotics, a lot of, there's like syphilis superbugs, there's this new genitalia mycoplasma, mycoplasma genitalia bug that is almost as bad as getting tuberculosis. So you've got this perfect storm of international travel and Tinder fucking with rampant STI blooms all over the world. And that's a swirling of, you know, like issues to come. So there's that. I mean, there's just so many. I can, I'll stop. (laughs) Got an idea. Some of them. Question. I like that. Yeah. It's, I just ask because with the rise of technology and dating apps and, you know, having sex basically at your fingertips now, like if you wanted to have somebody over that night. Yeah. I mean, like, but also I don't, I guess I don't know what it was like 30 years ago, you know, to be like young and, and exploring that type of world. But it seems now that it's just like a commodity. Like you said, it's transactional. So it's actually really nice to hear that people are kind of taking a step back from that and being more conscious about it and being like, okay, you know, let's not move too fast. And what does this look like for us? And talking about it because for so long, and like, especially when you're younger, like in your teens, it's so taboo, right? Like everyone wants to have sex. Everybody is having sex or it feels like it, but no one's really talking about it. And no one's talking about what a healthy sex life looks like in a relationship, right? So like, it could be me and my partner are having sex, but that doesn't mean it's like a healthy sexual relationship. So I'm, I'm hoping that things are becoming better, like communication wise, like you said, but I've actually heard that I think it's the generation younger than me. They, there's actually a decline in sexual activity due to screens and being online and having access to all of these different anime things and like all sorts of stuff like that, that actual like partner to partner, there's like a decrease in people going out and actually having sex with somebody else. So I don't know if you've heard about that or 
Yeah. And you know what I think is contributing to that as well? And I, I've heard those trends. I think that it's the food that kids are eating too, in addition to the screen time. If I go in, I never go into Safeway because there's nothing in there I want to buy, but I have to run in once in a while for, you know, whatever, a little thing that that's close because they have the latest one open, you know, because I'm an organic food snob. I live in Marin County, California. I mean, my lettuce is porn. It's so gorgeous. <laughs> you know, it's just like the things that we get to eat up yeah. here are amazing. But when I go into the store and I see the kids with their gushers and their slushies and their sugar thing and they're, and they're eating a bag of gummy worms. And I mean, they're, they're growing up on fast food, potato chips, sodas, you know, it's ruining their health. Yeah. And they are already from a lifetime of ju- juvenile sugar input. They're unhealthy children and unhealthy young adults. Mm terrible nutrition profiles. And that's, that's giving them anxiety and ADHD and low libido and suppressing their hormones and add to that the explosion of gender spectrum and all the confusion that comes in in middle school with gender identity now being extremely confusing, there's just a lot of, they don't exercise, they're playing computer games, they're eating sugar, and they're seeing all this weirdness on the internet. And I do worry about children of this particular generation, all the porn access. It's like a nexus of all of these things that are very degrading to the human body that have been layered up on these kids in their cultural reality. It'll be interesting to see, you know, the pendulum swings, the pendulum Mm -hmm. swings. In the 70s, we all fucked everybody. In the 80s, we just fucked a few less people and did more coke. In the 90s, we started to build our businesses and we got our kids gr- you know, out of us. And in the 2000s, we started raising our kids. And now, you know, it's like every era, they have their different pendulum swings of like fucking around and not fucking around, you know? Yeah. And every generation does it in a totally different way. And it's a constantly moving target. And plenty of kids will be perfectly fine. But I do worry about the nutrition health of our of a gener a couple of generations of kids. Yeah, that's pretty scary. Because like, if you're that young, and it's already hard going through puberty, and your hormones are everywhere. So balancing them, even from a nutrition standpoint is already difficult. Minus like all of the extra things that you just talked about, the fast food, the porn, you know, gender spectrum, all of these things. So for people who are listening, who are in that age bracket or are parents with kids that age, like, what would you recommend? Like, how do you go about sifting through this and creating a healthy idea of sexuality in in kids at those ages? It's funny. It's one of the things that people most commonly complain to me about is this idea that their parents never told them about sex and they're bitter about it. They feel like their parents didn't model good sex. They didn't tell them about sex. They were uninformed. They handed them a book and kind of tittered and ran away if they did anything or they scared them. They told them, you know, don't get pregnant or, you know, all that kind of stuff. So imbued them with shame. They never gave their genitals a name. They never said, this is your vulva. This is your clitoris. Your clitoral structure looks like this, the entrance to your vagina is called your intro. You know, they don't have the words. And then people grow up and they run into roadblocks in their sex life and they don't have the words to solve those problems. And so they end up not talking about it and then they drift apart intimately and then years go by and, you know, it's, it's pretty crazy. So if you have a child I think you have to start talking to your kid really early about how babies are made and what the anatomical parts are and how they fit together and what it's like when some people are gender same versus gender different and explaining that to kids. And then the next level is understanding why we humans are drawn together and what the comforts and pleasures of sex are and why it's nice to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a girlfriend or a boyfriend (laughs) and just helping kids understand their changing body and hormones and then uh, helping them navigate through dating and relationships and always being open to them being able to tell you anything and come Mm -hmm. talk to you. 
and reading up and learning on your own and feeling comfortable using the words and learning anatomy yourself and, and then showing affection and the fact that your mom and dad or whatever your parents' genders are, you know, you love each other and you have intimate connection and kids will through a process of individuation, kids will kind of recoil from the concept of their parents having sex, but allow them that expression because that's how they are individuating and moving away from you as being their parent and they being the baby and they're standing on their own, but know that they're hearing you. And so just keep dripping information to your children, a little drip at a time, and don't expect them to do or say anything except that's disgusting. <laughs> and that's not what they really, will, they'll ultimately appreciate you. You know, parenting is a bit of a thankless job in, the, in its doing. It's not till after the fact that your, your kids are like, you're such a great parent. Thank you so yeah. much. I must have been a real pain in the ass to yeah. talk about sex, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, I actually just had a call with my mom like that a couple months ago. And I was like, thank you so much for being so hard on me and keeping me disciplined. And now I have all these things going for me. But at the time, you're like, I don't like you. <laughs> you so mean. She yeah. doesn't like me. She doesn't let me do anything. Yeah. <laughs> but I've actually heard with, like, similar to what you're saying, is like when you're raising kids, right from the get-go, you call a penis a penis. You don't call it a PP or like, like these little like words that we've made up that are like kid friendly, but like you literally call it what it is so that the kid right away becomes very familiar with it and knows, Hey, this is mine. This is my private space. And this is what it's called. It's not some like little like taboo thing that we whisper and we don't talk about. So I love that. I think that's really good. And I think it's interesting with the parents because so many parents tend to hide their affection from their kids because it, like, it's uncomfortable or they don't want to be inappropriate in front of their kids. And then I've like, talked to friends who said, like, yeah, I've never really seen my parents kiss or like, I've seen them hold hands a couple times. And like, then that plays a part in their relationship. So I guess it's like, quite a mix of showing affection in a healthy way and then just letting them recoil, like you said, and just like, knowing that that is okay. That's an okay reaction. It's a perfectly normal reaction. Yeah. And you can only do the best you can do as a parent with your child. Children are very resistant to taking the information in. And then they grow up and they're mad at you because you didn't tell them. But they forget all the pushback they did and the eye roll they did when you yeah. did try to talk yeah. to them. And it is, it's not actually your parent's job to teach you about sex. And so when people are bemoaning to me, oh, my parents never taught me. I'm like, nobody's parents did. Get over yourself. Your job is to sure. teach you. It's personal development. Your sexuality changes throughout your life. And if you put your attention on it and you learn things, you get better and better in bed over time. I'm way better in bed than I've ever been. <laughs> and I just keep getting better. I keep getting sexier. I keep getting more confident. I keep having better orgasms. I keep having more kinds of orgasms. I, I am a better lover today than I was yesterday or a month before or a year before or a decade before. And your sex, you can be sexual your entire live life long. Yeah. It's, it's, you can, you're born sexual and you die sexual unless you don't pursue it. Many people don't pursue it, but for those who I call the sexual seekers who want the knowledge, they know that learning is power and not power, but you know, like learning is pleasure. Let's just put it that way. Those people, those are the kind of people who follow me because they love all the tips and the advice and the skills and the techniques and the raising of the awareness and the sharing of the map of possibility. And they want to keep learning. It's no different than working on your health or working on your career growth or working on your personal development or working on your IQ or your physical fitness. Your sexuality is just one more area of personal growth that is infinite. Sex just keeps getting better your whole life. And as you grow and mature, what you desire changes. And as you listen to yourself and tune into your being, what she or he asks of you changes and you just give your body what it's desiring because its desires evolve and mature. I love that because that is not the narrative that we hear from society. 
right? So we hear that testosterone starts dropping at age 30 for both men and women. So your libido starts dropping. And then if you have kids, oh, well, after that, your body's going to be like this and you're not going to want sex anymore and like all of these things. And from like multiple places and multiple people and over a long period of time too. So it's so refreshing to hear like sex can get better every day for you. Definitely. And I like, I want to unpack that. So like what, if someone's been in a relationship for a while and like, doesn't matter, boy, girl, whatever it is, boy, boy, what can someone start doing now to kind of explore that and get better at sex, get better at sex? It sounds like such a like blanket statement, but like how, how can you improve your sexual life with your partner, no matter what age, no matter what you guys are doing, like just in general? Why don't you ask me the question you really want to ask me that's completely selfish and totally for you? <laughs> It would probably be the same question. How do how do I get better at sex? I guess would be the the question. Okay. Like like so, I've been with my partner for a while, and we have a great sexual chemistry and sexual life. Good. But it's but it's a lot of work, right? And I, I'm very in tuned. But I think as a biohacker, I'm very in tune with my sexual health. And I, and most people who are listening are into biohacking, and I'm sure they are very in tune with their sexual health. So. I think the, the question is like, how, how do you level up and how do you, or how do you know that you can level up or need to level up, I guess? Oh yeah. You can always level up and you always need to level up. <laughs> if you're a level <laughs> up oriented person, leveling up your sex there. Um, when you said that it feels like a bit of work, tell me about mm. that. And, and don't worry about hurting your, is your boyfriend, right? Yeah. Don't worry yeah. about hurting his feelings. He can handle anything you say. He wants to know the truth. So what, what's the word? Oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. Oh, and we like openly talk about this. It's, yeah. not, it's, it's not hidden. It, I think for us, it's more of, so I like to have sex like every few days, I would say, or like some sort of sexual encounter every few days. And if it goes longer than a few days into like, say a week or longer, mm -hmm. I'm like, what's wrong? Like what's going on? Like why, why aren't we having sex? And so for me, it's like a, I guess like a timing thing. And maybe for me, it's like a numerical value is put on it. So, oh, we're having sex two to three times a week. Oh, we have a healthy sex life. So the work part comes into it as, oh, it's been a few days. Oh, we should have sex because it's been a few days and this is what we're used to. And this is what makes a healthy sex life. So we should have sex, even if my libido isn't you know, up for it or like it's different part of my cycle and like all that sort of thing. Okay. And do you feel like he doesn't initiate enough or are you putting this, I'm almost hearing you say that mm -hmm. you have this kind of artificial, someone told you this is right. So now you're doing what you're supposed, think you're supposed to do. I think it's probably 50, 50 for initiation. And I think it probably has changed over the years. So when, which we're just like getting into my personal life, but it's fine. When I was on birth control for so long, yeah. my libido was a lot lower than it is now. And I've been off birth control for two years now. Yeah. And my libido is so much better. Like it's, it's crazy. It's so I think during the time when I was on birth control, and I know a lot of women report this is the partner is initiating more because, you know, he wants it more and you just don't have that urge. Like you, you, there's no, like, there's no sense of it. Like, yeah, we should have sex, but it's not like you actually like physically want to or desire to. So now you want more sex. Do you want more sex than he does? No, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I think we're probably about even. I think I have to get away from the idea of it having to be a certain amount of times in order to equal a healthy sex life. I think, I think that's my, that's, I don't know where I heard that. I don't know who told me that, what health books I've read, but I think that's like something that is obviously not true. And I just have like some false idea of. Yeah. Maybe um, not a limiting belief, but some kind of an expectation mm -hmm. that you've set. Mm -hmm. And so, okay. Let me give you some ideas. I want your sex life to be easier and less pressure. Mm -hmm. And I want you to focus more on, instead of thinking about sex, I want you to think about pleasure and connection and touch 
and mm. sensuality and relaxation and joy. And when you reframe it that way, it puts less pressure on the two of you. And I think it's interesting to uncover that kind of that, that pressure that you've had of feeling like if you don't do this, you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. And try instead, here's a way to remove that pressure and to have more exciting growth in your sex life at the same time. Maybe think about having a couple of erotic play dates every week instead of sex. Maybe three. And think about, okay, we're going to learn some new techniques together. We're going to practice them. So maybe you want to do some G-spot pleasuring and you want to de-armor your G-spot. You want a lot of G-spot touch and massage. Or maybe you want to learn how to receive a full yoni massage. Or maybe you want to learn how to ejaculate and you want to experience female ejaculation. Or maybe you want to learn how to give a lingam massage, massage his penis and take him up into pleasure and then take him up and down the arousal ladder and learn how to take him to the edge and pull back and take him to the edge and pull back and really give him what's essentially an incredible hand job. Or maybe you want to learn how to give yourself orgasms from going down on him. So you want to expand your orgasmic experience in your mouth, not just your yoni. Maybe you want to start working with all the muscles in your vagina when you're having sex and you want to try to squeeze his penis from the bottom to the top and then the top to the bottom and start articulating all those muscles. Maybe you want to do some different types of intercourse techniques like Taoist thrusting. Maybe you want to try three new sex positions this month or have sex outside or maybe you want to do some role play. You know, you've always wanted to dress up like a little Catholic girl and get a spanking over daddy's knee. Or maybe you want to have him learn more oral pleasuring skills because when he goes down on you, it's nice, but he can't actually take you into orgasm and hold you there and give you repeated orgasms for 10, 15, 20 minutes just with oral pleasuring. So you want to develop more oral pleasuring styles. Or maybe you want to try some sex toys. You want to try strap-ons or butt plugs, or you want to try a new vibrator that you can use while he's He's inside you, but you can get yourself clitoral stimulation at the same time. Or maybe you want to, I don't know, maybe you want to do a 30-day solo masturbation challenge or you both want to do um, mutual masturbation for 30 days and then see how that affects your sex life. Like mm -hmm. what I'm doing is I'm just throwing out a shit ton of ideas. Mm -hmm. Something in there or three or four of those things probably were like, oh, that's interesting. So tell me two or three of the things I said that sounded interesting to you. Oh, like the masturbation thing is really interesting. The 30 days. I love that idea. Yeah. And then also I like the idea of different places and outside. We do that already. And that has always been something that we have brought and is so fun and stimulating and spontaneous and really just like ignites that spark. So I definitely think there's like a lot like, and it's funny because you've like, I feel like you think you have such a healthy sex life, like which we do. And then you hear a whole bunch of things that you could do. And you're like, wow, okay. Like there's so much out there. And then it just goes back to what you're saying of like, your sex life can always get better. Because like there is no end, really. Yeah. So now you have a couple of ideas and you could run this list as a menu to your partner and say, why don't we each, I wrote all these things down and added some of my own or I, you know, start your own list mm -hmm. and then have him do his list and then take all the papers and throw them into a fishbowl and then all the ones you decide you want to do. And then each time you have a lovemaking date, an erotic play date scheduled, mm -hmm. but you're not having sex anymore. Yeah. Sex is no longer, you're not doing sex two to three, three to two to three times a week. Yeah. Now you're having two to three erotic play dates a week. Mm -hmm. And you could either have a list of the ones that are your bucket list that you want to knock off, some of his, some of yours, or you could just have a fishbowl and pull one out and do whatever one that was. There's lots of ways to play with this. But when you go from it being sex to being learning something new together, that's mm -hmm. what keeps the new sexual relationship energy exciting. Okay. Because desire 
is this equation. I learned this from the late Deborah Annapol, one of my mentors. She said that desire is, is so it equals safety and novelty. Mm. Safety plus novelty equals desire. And if you have just safety, it's boring. If you have just novelty, it's too edgy. Like you can't be going out and having sex with somebody new every single day. It's a little too much for most people. So what you have to do is have interesting sex with the person or people you love and are comfortable with to keep that spicy and exciting. And that's what keeps desire going. I love that. That makes so much sense. Another thing just that I've just thought of is over the years, we've actually bought board games from like sex shops. Oh, those are fun. And those are so fun. And oh, it's like, adorbs. And we, <laughs> whenever I have friends over, I always get like messages later like, hey, can we actually borrow that one that you were talking about? And I lend them out because like they're just like card games or whatever. But that's exactly what it is. It's intimacy and it's fun and it's new and it's challenging rather than like, okay, Thursday night, I guess we're just going to have sex tonight. It's like, no, let's play this board game. And oh, like I have to do this with an ice cube. Cool. Never done that before. Let's see how that goes. Like, I don't know. Like, great. Like, oh, and it's, yeah, there's so many too that are so fun. Like, so That's adorable. Fun. I love it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there, I think I've solved your problem. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So for people who are in a relationship right now, how would they know if they have a healthy sexual relationship with their partner? Like, what would you say would be the telltale signs? They're sexually satisfied. They enjoy and both are mutually pleasured. They feel joy and deep connection and relaxation. They look forward to having sex. They're, they wish they could have more than they do, but life is busy. They're trying new things. They're getting better in bed together. They feel like their private, private life is one that fuels them and deepens their overall relationship. They feel sexy. They think sexy thoughts and they are happy with their partner, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so if you're single and you're by yourself, what would a healthy sexual relationship with yourself look like? Well, I think that there are so many wonderful ways to expand your own orgasmic palate, whether that's learning and building new neural pathways for pleasure with your own body, using your hands or using water jets or whatever you want and uh, toys. There are so many good sex toys. The toys that I've been really getting into lately are from the Fun Factory. Fun Factory makes some really interesting toys. So both for male and female bodied people and their medical grade silicone, I'm, I don't get paid by them. I just really like, they have a, they're a 22 year old company with German engineering. They're out of Bremen, Germany. They've got a USA group here and they do a wide variety of amazing toys with gorgeous motors, rumbly vibes, body safe materials, just a really great variety. So like they've got, they're the only ones that I know that have something called pulsators, which are actually, you can put them inside your vaginal canal and they actually stroke the vagina. And that really increases lubrication and engorgement and blood flow. And so instead of just thinking about a vibrator on the clitoral structure, you can actually have something that goes inside and goes on the clitoris. That's wonderful. There's a lot of prostate tools for men and they can explore their pee spot or blended orgasms, prostatic and you know penis pleasuring at the same time with either uh, just a stimulation or with a vibration and stimulation. I mean, there's just so many great sex toys that if you're single, there's two things I'd say. Number one, Think about taking a lover who may not be the be-all and end-all and complete you from a ticks everything off the list perspective, but someone that is a high integrity, pleasurable person that your body loves and their body loves yours, that you can have really great chemistry and really great sex with that doesn't need to go any further than that. Take a lover or a Mm -hmm. few and enjoy solo play with yourself and your own body or with the beauty of amazing sex toys. 
Mm -hmm. So what role do you think solo play has in a relationship? I think it's a really vital part of it. If you're shy and you don't want to masturbate in front of your partner, then when they're not around, masturbate. And if you like it and you like mutual masturbation or your partner likes to watch you and you like to be watched, do that. And what you'll find is that as you masturbate more and more, you, be, you stay more engorged, you feel more arousal and desire. It generally just keeps the juices flowing. <laughs> yeah, it does. So switching gears a bit, you briefly touched on nutrition for libido and a healthy sex life. And I'd love to just unpack that and what you recommend to clients, like overall diet, but maybe also specific foods that increase libido that you've like seen or had experience with. Sure. Well, your libido is your life force, is your vitality, is your sexual vitality, is your creativity, is your passion. If your gut isn't working, if you're not waking up and taking a nice, easy shit, you need to work on your gut. If you have any kind of acid indigestion, bloating, your tongue hurts, your breath stinks, anything, zits, eczema, whatever, you've got to look at dysbiosis, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, candida, parasites, all that kind of stuff. Your health starts in your gut and moves from there. So what you put in is a reflection out externally. And a lot of people have a lot of food allergies. If you have any kind of mood spectrum disorder, if you have any anxieties, if you have sleeplessness, any of those kinds of things, if you're depressed, start at ground zero, which is what's your gut microbiota? What have you been taking antibiotics? You know, you've got to keep that flora very good in your gut and eat organic foods and be pooping and peeing regularly. And then you've got to work to detoxify your system saunas, sweating, exercise, skin brushing, taking things like cytodetox, which is a cliptolinol, it's a zeolite that has these little cages that collect especially heavy, heavy metals, mm. even through the blood-brain barrier, and let them pull through and out, making sure that you're not overly consuming alcohol, you're not eating sugar, you're not eating like white bread and white flour and gluten, not eating a lot of corn, not eating vegetable oils, not eating French fries, so that you've got a clean running system and everything's flowing through and you're getting rid of the toxins that we all take in through our health and beauty aids, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the plastic and everything. Don't cook in plastic foods anymore, cooking glass. Just try to minimize all, all plastic Watch the health and beauty aids. Watch your what you're washing your clothes in. Try to minimize dry cleaning. You know, really be careful about all of the things you're slathering on your body, the makeups you use. Watch your mm -hmm. fingernail polishes. I wouldn't. I don't even use fingernail polishes. You mm -hmm. try to cut as many places as you can out on any toxic load. You try to lower your toxic load. Once all that's going, it really starts to work well. And you can, if you've got low stress, not high stress, you're getting good sleep, your body should be able to produce its own hormones. But you can also support your hormones with botanical libido stimulants, if you will, such as the, the three big ones are Tonkat Ali, Fenugreek, and tribulus terrestris. Those are the three, and it's best to herb cycle those, but not to take those if you're not even getting a good amount of vitamin D and magnesium and boron and the other vitamins and minerals that are required to live a healthy life. So you want to take your one a day, and then you want to stack on your libidos, and then you want to look at nitric oxide production. Because as you age, your hormones and your nitric oxide production decline, as does your NAD. So uh, getting, making sure you're getting your niacin, your vitamin B3, and then looking at, well, what I like is citrulline over arginine because so many people have herpes and arginine is a, a herpes instigator. It's, it's really gives you herpes. It, it can give you flare-ups and about mm -hmm. three quarters of the population have at least HSV-1, if not HSV-1 and 2. Right. And so uh, citrulline or citrulline malate with some vitamin C and some N-acetylcysteine, that combination is very good at getting the blood flow because the penis and the vulva have the same amount of erectile tissue. And so we women, we have to watch our erectile function 
equally with men. When you are not getting proper blood flow to your genitals because your nitric oxide is low, you're getting diminished orgasmic pleasure and sensation. And when you're not getting full engorgement, blood flow through manual stimulation of your vulva, through frequent masturbation, through frequent oral and intercourse, then that blood supply diminishes, the nerves recede, the blood vessels recede, the tissue actually atrophies, and you get sensation loss, and your orgasmic pleasure goes down. It already happens from aging anyway, so you've got to counteract against aging. As young as 30, you need to start really getting that blood flow going. Wow. It's a lot, <laughs> but I, it's just healthy living. It's just, it's healthy just living. playing with your genitals and healthy living. Yes. Yeah. It's like biohacking really. Yes, I, right. yeah, I say similar things to you, like clients and people I talk to is like, there's no point in taking supplements or anything. If your gut isn't able to absorb them in the first place, Yep. like it's just literally going straight through you. So heal the gut and then start bringing in things for these other weird like symptoms that you're having or maybe low libido or whatever it is, but it absolutely starts in the gut. And then I also think a big part of it is like mental health too of stress. Like, I don't think you could have high stress and high libido at the same time. Like, I don't think it works like that. Like so many people are running around and you know, they're working 10 hour days and then they're going to the gym and they're stressing their body out. And then it's just stress all the time like go, go, go. And then you're on your phone and you have all these notifications and like, just, it's almost like we're just overstimulated, but understimulated in our sex life as a result of that life and stress. So, I mean, I'm sure you have plenty of like stress reducing techniques that can help as well. In addition to the nutrition, like you talked about. So I don't know if you have like a top one or two that you would recommend for people listening. Yeah. The number one stress reliever is yoni and lingam massage. Mm. Massage your partner's penis, massage your partner's vulva. Learn how to do it really well. Use organic coconut oil or organic avocado oil. I have an Amazon store and I keep them in there. I don't make them myself. I just put my preferred brands in there. I think it's amazon.com slash shop slash Susan. And the ones that I've tried that are tried and true that I've recommended to thousands and thousands of people, you can get right on Amazon. Coconut, avocado. Those are really nice. So get, just keep a gallon of that shit in your bedroom and rub <laughs> each other constantly all over all the time. Breast massage, yoni massage, yeah. ass massage, body massage, neck massage, foot massage, head massage, face massage. Just love each other up. Yeah. Yeah. I actually heard you say that on another podcast, Foot Rubs. And they are the best thing for relieving stress. Yeah. Like even, I, I'm, I could just be me, but like it just, I feel yeah. like, you know, you, you're on your feet all day and it just feels so nice to have somebody release the tension that's built up there. Yeah. And then it totally releases stress and like helps libido. So like I think massaging and like touching in general, that's not necessarily sexual, like more intimate or like sensual, like you say, can just have like such an impact on your whole life. And just like even outside of your sexual life, like your health in general is just, um, yeah, like I totally agree. <laughs> I think you might be up for a foot gasm. You get your partner to rub your feet and tell them exactly what feels good and get really feeling in a sexy mood and then actually have him stroke your f whole foot like he strokes his penis when he masturbates and have him actually almost like jerk your foot off. It sounds crazy, but you can come from it. Wow. Something I haven't Add tried. that one into the fish. That's one for the fish bowl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, a footgasm. Oh, yeah. okay. I know what I'm doing this weekend. So Good. <laughs> I love it. Oh, that's hilarious. I would report have back. I will. I will we'll do a follow up episode, like a how to. Oh yeah. my gosh, that's so funny. I like see. That's the thing is like I would have never thought of that, and I think it's just really taking ownership and like being proactive in your sex life to learn new things and to research and like look at the information that you put out in your books and YouTube and all of these things because there is so much information out there and there's so much to learn. I guess I don't know. 
So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I feel like I learned so much. Such a great topic. Like I haven't really talked about sexual health yet and it's such a key part of biohacking. So just like so awesome to have you on. I really enjoyed it. You're a, just a doll, just a total <sighs> pleasure. I love you. I love your brand. I love your show. I love what you stand for in the world. And thank you for being so vulnerable to actually answer honestly what was going on with your sex life because people love you, Britt, and they want to know they want to know what's going on with you. And so thank you for sharing uh, in a very vulnerable way. And I think we ended up with your fishbowl fantasy strategy. And mm. I am really looking forward to hearing back about some of the new experiences that you have. And I hope you'll share them on your show as you go because people need permission and encouragement to have more pleasure. And that's one of the things that you do so well. So mm -hmm. thank you for having me. Awesome. Yeah, I will definitely report back. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm.